Hello everyone and welcome to the Mochi Beans channel. I'm Caden and today we are going to be tackling one of the harder sections of this series, which is tackling player animation. We're going to go through a top-down idol, top-down run, and maybe some other extra things, just to add some movement into the game. Now, to get started, let me talk about directional sprites. So, you design your player character in the last episode, However, because the player has to orient itself depending on the direction of the mouse, you'll have to create separate sprites for each direction. This is because in bullet hell games you have to show where the player is aiming. Here are some normally quite overlooked elements that you have to remember when you're making directional sprites. So this first one might seem quite obvious, but keeping proportions consistent is vital to your player sprites. Remember, the person playing your game will be seeing this sprite all the time when they're playing, so if something's a little bit off, like a hand is bigger on the sprite facing towards you than the sprite facing towards the side, that's going to be really noticeable, and it will seem a little bit off. So the way I'd overcome this problem is by drawing all four sprites, because you'll need at least four directions, next to each other, before putting them into their separate frames. This way you can line it up so that each sprite is exactly the same size and has exactly the same proportions as the others. Another thing that a lot of people overlook is light. The light source doesn't change direction when you turn, because it's just consistent and it'll stay in the same place. So if your light source isn't from directly above and is slightly angled to one side, you'll have to edit your sprites so that the light is coming from the same direction at all times, no matter which way the player is oriented. I made my light source from the side just to show you this. See how it's always coming from the top left of the screen? So the player's hair is always affected in the same location, relative to the light source. Also something that I would recommend is trying to keep the face visible. The player will want to see the face of your character, so if you keep it visible, it's just there and it's nicer. Even though it's not really accurate perspective-wise, it will give your game a nicer feel, because of relatability, which is what I talked about last time. The only time you can't really do this is when the player is facing away from you, because it would look a bit strange. So now that you have your directional sprites, time to actually animate them. I'm going to start with the idle animation, just because it doesn't normally require that much redrawing of sprites and it's quite easy to understand. The purpose of the idle animation is just so that when the player is standing still, there's still some movement on the screen, so the player is still engaged. Most of the time, it's drawn as quite exaggerated breathing. However, if you want, you can make it just bouncing or swaying to show a bit more personality. The great thing about the idle animation is that you really only need two frames, an up frame and a down frame, since the purpose is just for some movement. However, I prefer having mine four frames per orientation, just to make it look slightly smoother. So now, for the first time of many, I'm going to be referring to the 12 principles of animation. So just for some context, these 12 principles were first introduced by the Disney animators Ollie Johnson and Frank Thomas. In their book, The Illusion of Life, Disney Animation, released in 1981. Even though these principles are from 40 years ago, they still hold up to what we call good animation, or appealing animation. They are still followed by the animated community to cover a massive range of media, such as video games and cartoons. They're a good place to start off as a beginner who's not really done much animation before, and something to refer to throughout your animating career. They don't have to be in a certain order, so I'm just going to go through the ones that are relevant to what I'm talking about now, which is the idle animation. So for now I'm going to be talking about follow through and overlapping action. These two are normally seen as quite closely related, which is why they're put together quite often. Follow through is the idea that loosely connected parts of the object, something such as hair or an antenna, will carry on moving even after the body or object or anything has stopped moving. And it also states that eventually it will be pulled back or sprung back towards the object or character, going back to its original and stationary position. You can imagine this as a cape, where as the character runs, cape will move along with it, at a slightly different speed, seeming more floaty and it'll look like it's being pulled by the character, and when the character stops, it will carry on moving until it goes back into its static position. This technique applies no matter what direction the character or object you're animating is moving in. 
and I briefly mentioned at a slightly slower speed. And this is basically what overlapping action is. So it describes how different parts of the object, which are loosely connected, will move at different rates. Because if the entire object just all moved at the same time, it would look quite static or robust. Notice that when you breathe quite heavily, your chest tends to move first, followed by the shoulders and then the head. They don't all move at the same speed and they also stop at different times. It sounds quite complex, but it's not that difficult once you start getting used to it. All you need to do is slightly stagger the movements on each body part, and then you've got a realistic looking idle animation. You should also change the speed of the animation based on how you like it. You don't want the character to look like they're hyperventilating every time they stop moving, but you also don't want them to look like they're asleep. Remember to animate every other orientation, and keep it consistent. For example, on frame 2 of all of the animations, the same thing should be happening, whether it's the shoulders lifting or the head going down. You can see that when I put my animations side by side, they're all consistent, because they're all synchronized. Don't forget to check your animations throughout the animating process, just to see if something works or not. You'll get used to seeing if something looks natural or not, if you just animate a bunch. Okay, so the next animation we're going to be covering is the walk or run animation. The reason I'm putting walk and run in the same category is because they're basically the same, it's just the run is a slightly more exaggerated version of the walk. For a bullet hell game, you want to go for an animation which is slightly in the middle of a walk and run as well, because you don't want the player to just be full on sprinting everywhere, but you also don't want them to be just nonchalantly walking around, because your sense of speed is determined by the animation mostly, when people are watching or playing your game. For this animation, also take into account what we said last time about follow through and overlapping action, as they are key for this as well. So in my opinion, for this movement animation, whether it's a run or a jog or a walk, you'll need at least six frames. However, I'm going to go for eight, just because it's slightly smoother. If you analyze how most people walk, you can simplify it into four frames, which just repeat twice, and the second time it's on the other side of the body. This is because you alternate left, right, left, right when you walk. The first frame you'll need, contact. This is when the foot touches the ground. The second frame is down, where the knee bends on the limb that just touched the ground. The next is called the passing pose, where the other leg steps in front of the leg that touched the ground. And the final one is the up pose, where the knee that was bent extends now. This then repeats on the foot that crossed over. It will bend, the other foot will cross over, and then the knee will extend again. And this will be repeating, and that's what the walk animation is. You can easily tell which are the lowest and highest points of the animation, being down and up, just from their names. And the reference point, which is the highest point of the body, is the head. So. I like to draw out the head first, because it's an easy reference point for the rest of the animation. Going back to overlapping action, notice that the body will drop first, and then the head will drop. So this means that the head is, in a way, one frame behind the body. This makes it easy to place the body. Now you should have something looking like this. And the cycle for the head and the body are exactly the same. Uh, for both repeats. So now that you've animated the head and the body, you have to move on to the limbs. And I'd start with legs because it's very clear where they go in each frame based on the names of the frames. So when I draw the legs, I just get a random colour and I just draw short sticks to represent the lower legs. It's very important to remember where the floor is in this stage of animation, because you want the location of the floor to be consistent. You might also want to, at this stage, observe a reference, to try and fit the run to a certain style. For example, if the leg is closer and higher to the player, it will look more like a march, rather than a run. And if the legs are much further out, it might look a bit comical or cartoonish. You might also just want a reference to try and get the legs in the right place. Okay, so now your animation should look like this. The great thing about legs is that you only have to draw one of them, because the other leg is just a repeat of the first leg, offset by four frames. So for example, in the up frame when the player leaps up, the front leg will be right at the front, 
and the back leg will be all the way at the back. But in the next up frame, the rolls will be reversed. So the back leg or the leg furthest away from the camera will be all the way at the front and the front leg will be all the way at the back. So you can see how just offsetting them by four frames already creates a realistic animation. And that's basically what I've done here. A really useful tool for this is the onion skin tool. So in Game Maker, you can see that it's just above the play button uh, and also the looping button. So if you click that button, there will be colored borders which appear around the frames that it's onion skinning. You can change how many frames that it shows in the onion skin by going into view right at the top and then click onion skin settings. Then you can change how many frames forwards and backwards it shows. The reason I'd use the onion skin tool at this part of the animation is because you don't want the legs to move too drastically from frame to frame. You want to run to look like a continuous motion that can loop. So if the leg is a bit choppy in one frame, it might look like disconnected. Now you can see that I've offset the leg so it looks like a full run instead of just one leg going round and round. So this was my result when I copied and pasted the leg four frames ahead on each frame. The next thing you have to do is just add the upper leg to each section as well as thickening up the lower leg. This will actually add some proper shape to your character rather than the lower legs just being sticks. You can see that in most of these time lapses I've had a sort of translucent version of my character in the background while I've been animating. And this is just so that I can check if the proportions are consistent or not. You'll notice that I make all of the legs shorter suddenly for no reason, but this is actually because I wanted to keep it true to the original design of the character, and I had made the legs way too long, so I just shifted them all up. You might have a similar problem where some part of your character in the running animation is different to your normal character. So I'd say don't be afraid to change it, because in the end you'll have a better result. Because we're using this sprite for the bullet hell game, in bullet hells most of the time the player will be holding some sort of weapon or gun. So this means you only have to animate one of the arms, because the other arm is going to always be holding something. And even if it's not holding anything, you can still have it stationary, it doesn't look that weird. So for the arm I went through a similar process to the leg, I just drew the lower arm, moving up and down, and then after I was happy with that I connected it to the shoulder. This is another place references help a lot, because a lot of people get confused where the arm goes in each frame. Just make sure that when your arm moves forward, that the other leg moves backwards, so they alternate. Because you want the right arm to move at the same time as your left leg, and you want your left arm to move at the same time as your right leg. Obviously you won't be drawing one of these arms, so it makes life a bit easier. So now, for filling in colour and shading and things like that, you've basically got the full character structure out. All you need to do is fill in the colours. So the way I do this is I just start by copying and pasting the head from your normal player sprite onto your run animation. This gives you a bit of sense on which direction the player is facing, and it will show you which parts to shade in with highlights and shades and things like that. Next I'd go and grab the colours from your original sprite and just fill them in into the, your animation. So this is when you get a rough idea of what looks good or not. You can still edit parts of your run animation at this stage if you want, but one thing I'd recommend is try not to be such a perfectionist. Uh, I have a habit of falling into this trap, but I spend ages on animation trying to get it perfect. Uh, but sometimes you just have to accept that it won't be perfect, and you can just accept a fairly good animation. Now for adding in shading. Shading is pretty difficult when it comes to animation, because if you just shade each individual frame as it comes, you run the risk of each frame looking very separate to the others. And this means when you string them together, they might be quite messy looking. So I recommend firstly just concentrating or focusing all your attention onto one section of the animation. This might be, for example, the body. So shade the body on each frame, not concentrating your areas on anywhere else, it's okay if they look flat at the moment because you'll bring your attention back to those later. 
So just keep shading the body on each frame, uh, making sure to flick back between the frames just to check if it looks natural, making sure the shading is in the same place every time. Once you've done the body, do this for every single part of the entire player. And at the end, you'll have an animation where all of the shading is in the same place, roughly, and it will end up looking quite clean. Now you bring your attention back to the overlapping action and follow through that I talked about last time. Try and see if there are any parts of your player, like the hair, which are only loosely connected, and vary their movement a bit, and don't keep them static. You can see that once I had finished all the shading and everything, I went back to do the hair. And this is what my finished sprite ended up looking like. Thank you for watching another one of these videos. They're really fun, and even though they do take a bit of effort, I enjoy posting it and getting all your feedback and opinions. If you do follow along with this tutorial, I would really want to see your animations. And if you want some feedback on it because you're not too happy with it, or you want to see if you can improve it in some way, join our Discord. It's still quite a small community, and we try to help anyone we can. The next video will be on items. Item animations, item sprites, and it will be much more focused on creativity and just letting your imagination do whatever it wants. That said, I'm going to leave you to it now. See you later.